Welcome to Fridays with Vistage. I'm Bill Black. I'm a Vistage member and speaker and the host and founder of ExitCoachRadio.com. And I will be your moderator today. I just wanted to remind everyone listening today that you will be able to get the slides to today's presentation in the Q&A section. You'll see a link to the PDF. And about a week after the presentation, you'll get a link that will take you right to the recorded webinar so you can re-listen to it at that time. Today, we're going to talk about deciding when to sell your business in today's economic climate. You know, every business owner will someday leave his or her business. And for most entrepreneurs, the decision to sell can be a complex and emotional process. While each situation is unique, there are several common factors owners carefully consider when determining whether or not the timing is right for them to sell. In this webinar with Axial CEO Peter Lehrman, we'll cover the most important elements of an exit strategy, external factors to consider, techniques to maximize the business value, and more. Peter Lehrman is the CEO and founder of Axial, a membership network connecting CEOs with investors and buyers of mid-sized private companies. In his capacity as CEO, Peter is responsible for delivering on Axial's vision to become the trusted platform connecting professionals who run, advise, finance, and acquire private companies. Prior to founding Axial, Peter worked as a private equity investment professional where he witnessed the enormous challenges and inefficiencies CEOs face when attempting to access growth capital or find an ideal buyer for their business. Peter completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Virginia and received his MBA from Stanford Business School. And he lives in New York with his wife and two children. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Lehrman. Hey, Bill. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to have to update the uh, the bio. I've actually got a third little uh, child now, about uh, six months old. So we'll we'll update that for next time. Um, as I told Bill um, before uh, getting on with all of the rest of you that are here on the, the webinar today, I just want to apologize in advance. Uh, one of my kids gave me a, a, a pretty bad dose of laryngitis at some point in the last seven days and um, just getting my voice back uh, really in the last 24 hours. So I hope you all can hear me well and, uh, and it's, not, uh, it's not too rough to listen to me. Um, it's uh, great to be with everybody again. I think this is my third or fourth webinar with Vistage talking about selling companies, valuing companies, um, and just making sure that there's really good education out there among the Vistage membership on uh, some really, really key things, some key pitfalls to avoid. Uh, it's easy stuff to, uh, if you just know about it and, uh, and remember to prioritize it when, uh, uh, when it's your time to, uh, to make big decisions with your business like this. So uh, we're going to cover a few things today. Um, specifically, uh, I've got sort of five items here uh, just to, to cover. I think it'll take about 30 minutes. <clears throat> the first is understanding the importance of timing. It, it really does matter. Um, then I want to just explain what I consider to be three of the biggest external factors that drive the valuation of your business, and therefore you need to be aware of those factors. Um, and no matter how well your business is doing or not doing, you always want to be aware of these sort of three external factors. Uh, then I walk through a couple of internal factors that are much more within your control than the external factors, um, which are just sort of uh, the hand that you're dealt at any given point in time. I've got a couple of basic but really important mistakes that you've got to avoid. They're easy to avoid. You just you just um, you just got to really plan for it uh, and make sure you're not <coughs> winging things uh, when it comes to something as important as selling your company or taking outside capital. Um, and then uh, I'll wrap up uh, just with um, some resources and education that uh, all of you here today can use uh, and consume on your own time uh, around all of these topics as well. So uh, as, it, as it pertains to timing, <clears throat> I'm going to just skip over uh, the introduction of myself because Bill did a great job. Um, very quickly, uh, maybe 10 seconds. Uh, the company I started about six years ago is focused on connecting CEOs and CFOs uh, running private companies to buyers and lenders, uh, and we do it through a confidential online platform that we've built. Um, we're focused on serving businesses that have somewhere between five and 100 million in sales, 
And so we've been partnering with Vistage over the last two years because the, uh, the overlap has, has been uh, great from both, uh, both sides. So <clears throat> on timing, I think you want to just be able to ask and answer this question inside your own head. Are you thinking about uh, selling your business over the next 12 months? Are you in a one to three year time frame or are you in a three plus year time frame? Um, if you're thinking about it in the next 12 months, you've got to immediately dedicate a stream of work to yourself um, in order to uh, avoid making big mistakes. Um, you, cannot, uh, you cannot wing it and you cannot uh, hope that it's just going to come together uh, in the last minute. Um, if you're one to three years out, that's kind of an ideal timeline to be starting to really put some resources and commit some time to, uh, to how to prepare for and exit effectively. If you're more than three years out, I think it's good information for you to have, but I don't think it's urgent that you have to act on it, um, but it's good information and good education uh, that I'll be sharing um, in the next 25 minutes or so. Make sure I get these slides to work. <clears throat> so this is a chart that is, is really just here to illustrate why timing matters. So I'll explain what the chart is. Um, up at the top, it says max EV over rev multiple by year. So this is saying is that <clears throat> uh, each one of these bars represents a single company that was sold in that year, and the number indicates the multiple of the company's revenue that it was sold for. So these businesses, there are seven businesses that were sold uh, in each of these um, in each of these bars. Um, this is the highest multiple that a business was sold for in the uh, American software industry, starting in 2010, and then the last bar is 2016. So in 2010, there were a lot of software companies that were bought and sold in America. The software company that was sold for the highest multiple sold for 13.7 times revenue. In 2015, you can see that um, the highest multiple for a software company bought and sold in America was a little over nine times uh, sales. <clears throat> so there was a huge contraction in the multiples being paid between 2012, 2013, 2014, and then down to 2015. Um, and if all other things were kept constant, you would sell your business, your software business in this case, for about 33% less than someone who sold a similar business just a year earlier. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this happens, um, and the point of this slide is not to get into those reasons. The point of this slide is just to make sure that entrepreneurs understand your business can be doing very well, and that's not the only thing that's going to determine its valuation or its sellability. The external market matters, and so you've got to be able to understand uh, and appreciate just external factors and think about that when you're trying to get the stars to line up. So here are the three factors <clears throat> um, that I, I think are the biggest drivers uh, for any business in terms of its sellability. Uh, and the valuation that the business is ultimately able to achieve. The first category is macroeconomic and market conditions. Again, there's not a lot that you can control here, but you need to be aware of this. Uh, if you try and sell your company the day after Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns go under, that's a bad time to get started. Um, so you've just got to appreciate um, uh, the broader market uh, and what that's doing to investors and buyers. Investors and buyers are just like you and me. They're human beings. Sometimes they're fearful and sometimes they're greedy. And as an entrepreneur, you always want to be thinking about how can I sell my business in an environment where most people are feeling greedy as opposed to fearful. Second uh, bucket here is what are the transaction trends that are going on more specifically in your industry? Um, there's a couple of things to, to get into here, and I'll cover those uh, in the upcoming slides. And then... The third big factor is company performance and market position. These are sort of the, the sort of three really big factors um, uh, that I'll get into. 
So on the external factors, um, there's about, you know, there's about three things here. I broke it down into macroeconomic conditions, capital markets, activity and behavior, and then activity that's going on within your specific industry sector. Um, many companies, when they're buying uh, small and medium-sized businesses, they use uh, a certain amount of debt to finance the purchase. So the interest rate environment is actually a very big driver of multiples that businesses get sold for. When interest rates are low and companies can borrow a lot of capital, that makes it easy for buyers of businesses to use debt in order to partially finance the purchase of your company. Right now, interest rates, as I'm sure all of you know, are at maybe the lowest point, you know, really in sort of recent recorded history. Um, that's created an incredibly attractive environment for corporations to use debt in order to finance acquisitions. It also is the primary strategy that private equity firms use to make acquisitions and invest in companies. They put some capital in in the form of equity, and then they use debt to finance the remainder. So with low interest rates today, that creates a really favorable environment at a macroeconomic level for acquisitions. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that obviously matters a lot is what are the capital markets, what is capital markets activity in the equity markets? In other words, if, a stock, if the stock market is at an all-time high or the stock market is at least at a cyclical high, well, that means that companies can use equity in order to buy companies as well. So if a public company is worth $500 million uh, or that same public company a year later is worth a billion dollars just based upon how the stock market is performing, when it's worth a billion dollars, it takes only half as much stock for them to issue in order to execute a transaction. So when stock prices are high, M&A activity tends to rise because companies can use cheap debt, but they can also issue stock, uh, and they have to issue less stock in order to buy companies. Um, for those of you that follow the technology industry, this is how Facebook purchased Instagram. They didn't purchase Instagram with any cash. They just purchased Instagram with Facebook stock. And um, so the higher the stock price for Facebook, the easier it is for them to buy companies at high prices. Um, the third category is uh, industry sector transaction activity. There are consolidation cycles that occur in every industry. Um, sometimes uh, they're long cycles and they're very active over multiple periods. Sometimes they come and go in one or two years. Uh, for example, um, we have a client right now at Axial and he's interested in buying auto reparts uh, and uh, body shop repair businesses. And they, they, they've got about a $100 million business, and they're going around the country buying small and medium-sized auto body and aftermarket auto parts companies. And they're buying $5 million businesses, $7 million businesses, and there's a wave of consolidation occurring in that industry right now. When things like that are occurring in your industry, that sort of that creates sort of an, uh, uh, an elevated opportunity to sell into that cycle. Uh, they come and they go. You don't have to be participating in a consolidation wave in order to successfully sell your company, but it certainly is a valuable piece of information to have when you're thinking about timing. So those are sort of three really big categories just from an external perspective of sort of what's happening in your overall industry, what's happening macroeconomically at a high level, and then where are stock prices uh, for publicly traded companies and how does that lead them to be um, either more greedy or more fearful in terms of making acquisitions in order to grow. <clears throat> I think I'm just gonna skip over this slide. The only other thing that I can say is when CEOs, most companies are purchased by other corporations. Uh, private equity firms uh, acquire about 20% of privately held companies and the rest are mostly purchased by other corporations. So the other thing that is obviously just 
an important consideration as a seller of a business is are the CEOs that are running companies bigger than yours today, are they feeling pressure to grow the top line or are they more focused on profitability? Um, when they're um, focusing on growing the top line and that is a more important priority for them, they tend to be more acquisitive than when they're focusing on profitability. Um, so those are just a couple of other considerations related to the macro environment. <clears throat> the appetite of the acquirer universe is obviously another really important driver for you when you're sort of thinking about timing of a sale. Um, at some points in time, there might be a large number of acquirers that are focused on your industry, and at other points in time, there might be very few. As a seller, you want as many qualified buyers in your market as you possibly can find. And that's one of the jobs of a good investment banker is to make sure that absolutely every rock has been turned over uh, when you're out in the market selling your company. They need to do it discreetly and they need to do it professionally, um, but that's one of the most important jobs that a good investment banker does is ensure that every conceivable, credible potential acquirer is aware of your business and aware of the opportunity to pursue it. Um, one of the things that we talk about all the time at Axial with our clients is if you're waiting until the last minute to develop these relationships with potential acquirers, it always puts you a little bit in the back seat as the seller. So if you've spent 100% of your time focusing on building your company, building your products, uh, managing employee relations, and you spent none of your time as a CEO developing relationships with potential buyers of your company, potential investment bankers who could represent you. Um, you're really kind of starting from a standing start when it becomes time to actually begin the process of selling your business. Um, so we always tend to recommend that if you're really thinking about selling your business within the next three years, you need to be developing relationships every year, maybe three or four new relationships every year uh, that could potentially be relevant because it's just like a marriage or it's just like any sort of long-term relationship. If you, you know, try and move too quickly, you're much more likely to make a mistake. Um, if you pick up the phone and call a potential acquirer and say, we're selling the company, we're gonna sell it in the next six months, and that's the first time they've heard from you, they haven't met you before, that's a really, really different process than if you've met them a year prior, or two years prior, uh, and you've just traded notes, um, and you have a little bit of a foundation of a relationship uh, uh, to work off of. Um, I highly recommend the latter. You certainly can get it done uh, from a standing start, but it just makes things so much more high stakes and, uh, and riskier. Now, um, on the internal factor side, those are sort of the three big drivers on the external side. The internal factors that I think, th there's a whole host of them, but I think the ones that are the most important and that I find are most often overlooked by entrepreneurs or by uh, CFOs who are advising the founder, or advising the owner, is the, the financial readability of your financial statements. They're the quality of those financial statements, uh, the ability for outside parties to review them easily and quickly, when you go through a business sale process, those, those things are constantly being requested by potential buyers. Uh, at this point, you're under a confidentiality agreement and they have the right to ask you for that information. If it takes you a long time to pull that information for them, if the information is poorly organized and doesn't really reflect the way your business works, um, if there are errors in it, all of those things are any of those things can be a, a sort of a deal killer. Um, and it, this is one of the hardest things to resolve in a short period of time. So this is one of the most important things for you to have a lot of lead time on before you decide you wanna consider selling your company. You can't decide I wanna sell my company in the next 12 months and you know, or in the next six months. And if you've got you know, your financial statements in, in, in sort of a, a disorganized fashion, you won't, you'll, you'll, it'll be very difficult for you to sell the business. And if you do, it will probably be at a very disappointing price relative to what you could achieve 
if you took 12 to 24 months and really made sure that things were well organized, that they were readable, um, and you got them audited by you know a relatively high quality third party auditor. So those are things that are directly within your control as the owner of the business, as the CEO. It's really just a question of whether or not you decide to prioritize it. Um, it's not free. You know, good audits cost you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand bucks, maybe more. Um, so they're not free. But when it comes time to sell, um, it's just so much easier when you've already done some of that upfront work. So financial hygiene is probably the biggest mistake that I see small and medium-sized business owners uh, not attend to well in advance uh, of a sale process. Um, <clears throat> there's two other things that I'll cover at least. The first is, as I said, uh, and you can see it in this first arrow here, what is the status quo of your strategic relationships? And what I mean by strategic relationships is, as the owner of the company, you are the only one who can effectively sell the business. You cannot delegate this to a head of sales. You cannot delegate it to your marketer or your operations and manufacturing professionals. This is a CEO only job. And you obviously have to partner with your CFO or your head of finance on it, but you cannot sell a company unless the CEO is in the room. And so if you've got good established relationships with some investment bankers who you're thinking about potentially hiring to be your river guide, that's great. If you don't, you really probably want to start thinking about building those relationships and not feeling like you're in a rush to do it. Um, it's very hard to sell a company by yourself. It can be done. It's a lot easier when you have an investment banker there, and usually a good investment banker more than pays for themselves. They charge you 1% or 2% of the purchase price, and the purchase price is 10% higher. They've more than paid for themselves right there. So the status quo of your strategic relationships whether you're spending time prioritizing them, it's a sort of key area. It's not just with investment bankers. In fact, I, I think you should be spending much more time with the potential buyers that are in your market. They could usually be business partners of yours. They at least are going to be interested in having lunch with you once a year. I think it's a great use of your time to have those relationships. I mentioned it a few minutes ago. I just can't reinforce how valuable it is to have a little bit of rapport before you enter into a sale process like this. Otherwise, you have to create so much trust so quickly with buyers, um, and it's always uh, a steeper hill to climb. Um, the third thing on um, the internal factors thing that I really want to discuss today um, is the third business consideration, which is how is the business performing? And one of the uh, one of the areas that we see many, many entrepreneurs struggle with is selling their business when it's doing really well and when there is an undeniable story that they can tell that the future of the business over the next one to three years is really bright. Usually, not always, but a lot of the time, you see entrepreneurs decide they want to sell their business when they're tired when they, when the business isn't doing well, uh, when they have a major setback, they lose a couple critical employees. And it's natural to feel that way. I know the feeling as a CEO myself. Um, but it's the worst time <laughs> to try and sell your company. By contrast, when your business is doing great and you're winning new clients, you've got great repeat business, a new product is really taking off. That's usually when entrepreneurs are having the best time of their lives. And the last thing they want to do is sell their company. But whether we like it or not, that's one of the best times to sell your company. Because when you can tell a story to a buyer that the bloom is not off the rose and your business, and there's a really compelling, incredible future one, two, three, five year uh, future, <clears throat> they're, you know, you, most buyers are usually pretty smart. They see that, and that's the most interesting time for them to participate as a buyer. So it's a really, really tough call as an entrepreneur, <clears throat> but whether we like it or not, it's really true that when your business is doing well, 
most of the time we want to stick with our business and we don't want to think about selling, but that's usually the perfect time to actually consider an exit. So that's a tough reality to swallow, but I really think it's important for entrepreneurs to appreciate that. Um, down in the personal considerations, I'm not going to get into that today. I think it's honestly entirely, you could read a whole book on it or deliver multiple webinars on the personal considerations, <clears throat> but there are obviously very many of those having to do with family life and marriage and health and just how you want to spend your, uh, you know, how you want to spend your life on earth. So um, I'm going to punt on that one and, and not cover that one today, but obviously it's got to feel right to you uh, at whatever moment in time you decide to pull the trigger. <coughs> this slide here, um, the only thing I'm going to call your attention to on this slide is if you have not gone through a sale process before, um, I, I think I, I, I don't think I can emphasize it enough how demanding it is. Um, the amount of information that a buyer asks of you, the amount of time that you might have to spend with them, uh, the amount of diligence researching your company, researching your products, uh, evaluating your processes, understanding your customer relationships. It's a very, very big transaction. It's much bigger the much bigger transaction than buying a house or selling a house. It's usually ten times, you know, ten times or you know, twenty, fifty, hundred times bigger transaction financially. And so it's much, much more grueling. And um, it's just something that you really just want to be prepared for. Um, you know, you just got to be trained up and ready for it. Um, you can't go out, you know, out, walk outside and go run a marathon unless you've been trained to run a marathon. You really got to be ready for this. It's, it's, uh, it's a demanding 6, 12, 18-month period of time. Um, and so that, that's just another thing to be ready for. Um, I think one of, the, one of the really negative side effects and side effects of how demanding it is, is particularly if you don't have an investment banker who's helping you run the process, is it takes you away from the company because the CEO is the only person who can effectively sell the business. And so you got to really think about what the team looks like and who's your number two and, and, um, you know, and make sure that the house doesn't fall down while you're out selling the business. So um, it's a really, really important thing to think about um, and, uh, and really be mindful of. <clears throat> I'm going to just sort of recap what I just sort of laid out um, in particular around these sort of internal factors that are specific to you that are within your control. Um, so big mistakes all the way down the slide here. Any sort of, you know deep down whether you're sort of winging the process or not. And if you're winging the process, you might get lucky. But if you don't get lucky, um, it's usually going to put you in a, a really bad place. Um, so if you want to sell your business in the next 12 months, get going this weekend. Um, if you want to sell your business over the next one to three years, immediately start thinking about how to get an audit of your financials. Immediately think about the cleanliness and quality of your financial statements. Uh, if you're three plus years out, uh, just realize these things are, are coming down the road. Um, the third bullet, one of the things that happens when you're selling your company is you have to show the, the buyer's financial forecast into the future. So if you show forecast into the future and a certain amount of time passes, and there's always a certain amount of time that passes between when you first start talking to a buyer and when you guys decide to shake hands and close the deal, if in the interim period you've showed them a forecast of revenue or of profits and you miss it, there's nothing that more quickly undermines trust than everything else that you're doing, everything else you're talking about with them. So be, be very careful about showing rosy forecasts. When you can show a forecast to a buyer or an investor, and then two months later when they say, how did November finish? And you can say, we hit the plan that we shared with you in September when we started our conversations, you're building trust. You're demonstrating that you know your business and you know how to hit a plan. It's a huge asset to be able to do that. So don't show rosy forecasts because it only works until a couple of months have passed. And then when you miss them, all of a sudden it all unravels. Uh, un unrealistic valuation expectations. 
Um, that's a whole topic to itself. What's the right set of expectations to have? Um, again, I do think that good investment bankers should be able to, to provide guidance to you here. There's good information out in the market uh, on uh, the price for certain businesses, and that can be very helpful for you to do research on. Uh, just because your friend down the road sold his business for 10 times profits or 10 times sales, it, it just doesn't necessarily mean that that's what yours is going to sell for. So you really need to look at that carefully and, and um Obviously, you want to be ambitious. You want to sell it for the highest price. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, but, uh, but you have to have a, a point of view on, on what's going to be reasonable and achievable. Um, and I already covered the last bullet here, but uh, don't show a plan and miss it. It's a, it's a big problem when you're selling your company if you show a plan and, and then you're off track three months later. So those are the big sort of internal factors to avoid. Um, the way that... Um, this slide got cut off at the top, but I think what you're really trying to do, if you really want to sort of sort of perfect the whole thing and try and run a perfect process in terms of figuring out when to sell your company is you're just trying to align these stars. Aligning the stars, as, as anybody knows, is, is uh, it's just not something you can do overnight. It takes time. It takes thinking. It happens every once in a while. And so what I've got here, um, this is actually a, this is a real photo. This is a Orion's belt um, and then the three Egyptian pyramids right underneath uh, the three points uh, on his belt. I think if you want to try and align the stars as the business owner, what you're shooting for is make sure the business is working. In other words, if the business is doing great, I know that's the time when you want to have fun and enjoy it it's probably a time for you to think about selling the business. I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying that's one of the best times to sell your company. If the macro environment is reasonable, it doesn't have to be, you know, a raging bull market where, you know, stocks are at their all-time high. As long as the macro environment is okay. Um, what you don't want is, you don't want crashes, you don't want panic, you don't want a lot of fear out in the market uh, when you're trying to sell. Uh, again, that's one that's totally outside your control, but if you're trying to align the stars, that's one you got to be thinking about it. And then the third is you are ready. And what I mean by that is you've got your financials in place. You mentally are prepared for a six to 12 month marathon of meetings and due diligence. Um, and, uh, and you're mentally there and you're mentally, you mentally have the energy uh, to devote to that. And you've got a team at the management level who can more or less run the business um, without you there uh, constantly day in and day out doing everything. You get those three things to line up, um, and I think you can really top tick uh, the, the valuation for, for your industry and for the business that uh, you're building. I think if you can get two of these things, you're in good shape, uh, but certainly at least two. Uh, if you've only got one of these things, um, but the macro environment is terrible, I really would encourage you to buy your time. If your business isn't working, again, try and, uh, try and hunker down, uh, get, get stuff working uh, much better, uh, and then pick your head back up. As, as tempting as it is to, uh, to sell when your business isn't working, it's really the worst time to do it. So um, that's a really, you know, that, that's a high level in, in about 35 minutes. I wanted to show you all this curriculum that I've created for CEOs. It's a 100% online curriculum. You can do it uh, on whatever timeline you want. The slide got cut off, unfortunately, but there's four aspects to the curriculum. It's exploring your options, selling the business, raising capital, or if you're in big growth mode, the one on the right is growing through acquisitions. So that's four essentially uh, modules to a CEO curriculum. Um, we've produced this here at Axial. It's available online. Uh, we've decided to just make the whole thing free uh, and available to any CEO who wants it. Um, and each one of these four areas dives much, much deeper into a lot of the factors that I just laid out for you, especially the internal factors. We don't spend as much time on the external factors in the CEO curriculum again, because it's, it's outside of your control as the CEO. 
So um, anytime you want, those are available for you to dig in more deeply. Um, here's the uh, web address where you can go and download any of that uh, CEO curriculum. And again, those of you who want to sell in the next 12 months, it's urgent that you just download this stuff and, and read it. It will help you. Uh, you don't have to be a customer of Axial or anything to do it. It's all 100% free. Um, and those of you who are thinking about a timeline over the next one to three years, probably useful for you too. And then those of you three years out or more, you can bide your time and, and decide when, uh, when this is the right way to spend your time. But um, those are all of the um, prepared remarks that I have for today. Um, there were a handful of questions that I know came in before the webinar even got going. So I'm going to uh, push pause and turn it over to Bill Black and, and let him uh, just surface the questions. We'll try and get through as many of them as we possibly can. Thanks, Peter. Great job. I took at least two pages of notes, uh, single-spaced, on that presentation. That was fantastic. Thanks so much for that. We do have a couple questions that have come in just recently. Uh, one is uh, interesting. It's, I own a $5 million business, and I receive weekly email and phone solicitations from people interested in buying my company. Is this normal, or does this mean, is this an indicator that my company is in a hot industry right now, and if it's hot, should I push my timetable of 5 to 10 years up? Got it. Okay. Um, well, it would certainly it would be helpful to know the industry that, that you're in. Um, what I can tell you is there is a large and active market of buyers, investors, and investment bankers who uh, do a lot of solicitation via direct mail, via email, and via the telephone, reaching out to CEOs and um, and putting these solicitations out there. Some of them are real, and some of them are empty, you know, sort of fishing, fishing expeditions. Um, it's very hard to know in your position as a CEO um, what is real and what isn't real, and there's no way that I could help you with that um, just quickly here uh, in a Q&A session. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons that I started Axial was because I wanted to create a safe harbor for CEOs um, on the Internet where they could privately research and browse investment bankers, research investors, and investigate the reputations of some of these organizations that might be reaching out and soliciting you. Um, so we've built some tools um, that make it easy uh, for you to uh, figure out what's real uh, and what's a fishing expedition out there. Um, I think a good investment banker can, uh, can help you with that too. Um, but once your business has about $5 million in sales, that is a point in time, I, I think, when a meaningful number of qualified buyers might be interested in it. So I can't tell you definitively one way or another, but um, uh, I think uh, it's worth investigating. As it pertains to pushing your timeline up from five to ten years, I think it's, a, again, I think it all depends on, on you and, and, and where you are personally in your life. If you love the company, and you feel like you're in the first inning, well, then I don't think you uh, should push your timing up. Um, but I think if you can determine how real some of these solicitations are, and one of these guys makes you an offer you can't refuse, well, then at least you've got that option on the table. I think that's about as much as I can share in a, in a concise answer. That's terrific. You know, another question that I see a lot, Peter, is that uh, – uh, people are concerned that maybe the baby boomers who are, you know, between 50, early 50s and, and 70 now, uh, over the next few years, they, they are going to be enjoying a low tax environment. Uh, and uh, after that, of course, there may be a backlash. So uh, are a lot of, do you foresee a lot of people heading to market in the next four years in the low tax environment? How much influence does that have? I think it has a really big influence. Um, I really do. I, I think taxes are a big deal when you're selling a company because, you know, when you're buying a pack of gum at the store, it doesn't really matter if your sales tax is, you know, 8% or, you know, 8.25%. New York City has got the most outrageous sales tax of all. Um, but, uh, you know, when all of a sudden you're selling a business, um, you know, $10 million, $5 million, $40, $50 million purchase price, uh, taxes really, really matter, really matter. 
And, um, and so obviously it's too early to tell what the Trump administration is gonna do from a tax policy perspective, but it doesn't sound like they're gonna be raising taxes. And it's, it's not just taxes on businesses, Bill, but it's also uh, estate taxes and estate planning taxes. So if, you know, and any entrepreneur who's got a family is always thinking about, you know, selling their business in the context of, you know, family planning and estate planning. So I think we'll know a lot more in 2017 uh, about how favorable it will be. But I do think it's going to be more favorable over the next four years than over the last four years or maybe even the last eight years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, um, another factor that's coming into play, and um, Vistage is very good about keeping its members up to date on economic trends uh, through ITR Economics and other groups. And, of course, they're predicting a recession in 2019, at uh, last uh, I heard. And so what type of a uh, impact does that have on people's mindset to either wait out a recession or try to sell into a recessionary period if, as it's projected? Well, if it's in 2019, I mean, I don't know. I, I think, you know, economists are like weathermen in my mind, Bill. Um, you know, they're wrong more than anybody else, and, you know, and, um, and they still have a job. Um, so I think, <clears throat> I think a lot of these economic predictions are um, not worth, you know, the paper that they're printed on, um, even though it would be really helpful if they were, if they were accurate. It just seems so hard for any of us right. to know who to listen to. Um, it, if it is 2019, that's great news for all of us on the phone call because that's plenty of time. You know, 2016, 2017, 2018, that's plenty of time um, to, uh, you know, get your, your ducks in a row and, um, uh, and, and, um, and have, a nice, have a nice outcome. Uh, but I, I have to say, I, you know, you just, um, I mean, everyone's wrong all the time on stuff like this. Everybody was wrong about Donald Trump winning the presidency just a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I have a hard time believing that there's a human being on earth that can predict a... a uh, a recession uh, in 2019 uh, any better than 2020 or 2018 or 2017. So I can tell you right now, it's a nice environment. Interest rates are low, um, and there's more greed than fear in the air, and that's a good time. Um, but uh, none of us really know when you know when it's gonna when it's gonna go sideways. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple questions about timing. Now you mentioned cycles and timing. Does the timing differ if it's a strategic buyer that we're entertaining as a buyer as opposed to a private equity buyer? Well, you know, in theory, it, it, I mean, I don't think so. I think that strategic buyers, the thing you have to understand with strategic buyers is there's a number of things to understand there. But <clears throat> when a strategic buyer is thinking about making acquisitions, it, in one way or another, it's, it's linking to an initiative that the company has. And the company has, as it thinks about its plans over the next one, two, or three years. Um, and those initiatives might change. They may come and go. Uh, the business unit leader or the CEO might resign, and all of a sudden the strategy gets scrapped, and now it doesn't, you know, you know, now they're not interested in businesses like yours. So I think the thing that's important to understand about a strategic buyer is has to be some sort of really clear alignment between how they're prioritizing their strategy and their initiative and your company and what your company brings to the table. With a financial buyer, there are, you know, the, the, I mean, there are variabil you know, variabilities in timing there, but financial buyers are professionally in the business of buying companies. They do it Monday to Friday, 52 weeks a year. That is the business that they are in. And that strategy doesn't change. What they pay for a business, what businesses they like and don't like, that might change. But their job as a financial buyer is to raise pools of capital and put that capital to work by buying businesses and selling those businesses at some point down the road for more than they bought them. And so I think financial buyers, I think, are a more consistent, consistently active buyer of companies, whereas strategic buyers may come and go. 
Peter, we have time for about three more questions, and I have a couple that have come in live. And one is, uh, you can answer very easily, what's the difference between a business broker and an investment banker? Sure, no problem. This is an important question to uh, to have a good answer to. There's no, you know, uh, there's no sanctioning body out there that you know bestows the business broker title on. Uh, one professional and bestows the investment banker title on another. So it's not a formal or official definition. Usually, um, the major difference is the size of the businesses uh, that they are selling. Business brokers will sell businesses as small as a local, true local mom and pop business, a local restaurant, a local cafe, a gas station, a laundromat, <clears throat> and business brokers will go up towards businesses that sell usually for uh, maybe a total purchase price of 10 million bucks, five to 10 million bucks. Um, the fees that business brokers charge are usually also a bit different from investment bankers. Usually investment bankers are selling businesses with uh, with you know um, enterprise values, business values north of 10 million, and they're usually also in addition to charging a success fee, they're usually also charging some form of retainer to help you prepare the sale of the business, and they also tend to be um, much more hands-on in the sale process. Um, I'm sure that if a business broker were listening to this recording right now, he could, you know, sort of pick my answer apart and, and you know, in some ways, because there are variations from one to the next. But what I can say is that there's no clean, bright lines between them that I've ever really been able to fully establish. They tend to sell smaller businesses as a business broker, and they tend to be not as involved in the actual process of selling the company. Um, as opposed to teeing up introductions and, and meetings for you with potential buyers and then letting you take it from there. So those are a couple of, of distinguishing characteristics. But I've seen business brokers call themselves investment bankers, and I've seen investment bankers call themselves business brokers. Okay. Uh, can you, uh, with your experience, can you recommend a good resource for getting a business evaluation outside of engaging a broker or a uh, or a uh, investment banker? Yes, so there's a couple things that you can do there. There are <clears throat> professional valuation consulting firms that you can hire, and they will charge you a, f a flat fee to provide a professional valuation. So that's one option. Now, Evaluation consultant is not going to give you the magic answer to the value of your business. The value of your business changes every day, tiny bits at a time, based upon the number of buyers that would be willing to buy your business at that point in time. And so it's a market, just like any, you know, any, it's just like the stock market. It's just, you know, we can't, we can't really follow it as, as transparently as we can follow the stock market. So they can't give you a silver bullet answer, but they can give you a range. And uh, you know, I know some valuation consulting firms will charge ten thousand bucks, and I know ones will charge multiples of that. Um, but there are firms that are professionally in the business of providing valuation consulting, and um, and and they don't do any investment banking. Um, the other option is for you to um, use an online software-based valuation tool. Um, it's not as involved and as engaged as having you know, a team come in and uh, get a bunch of information from you. But if you want a quick and dirty back of the envelope forecast uh, of your valuation, um, there are some nice software-based valuation tools that you can um, just get on the internet. Uh, we've built a tool at Axial. Um, it's uh, fairly primitive, but it gives you a good range. Um, and so we've got one that's available. Um, and if you want to email me after, I can refer you to a couple of others. My email address, I think, is still up on the slide right now. Uh, but I'm happy to make uh, uh, a handful of referrals um, with, uh, with no, no dog in the hunt. 
Uh, before the last question, there's one uh, uh, comment on the, this show that says, uh, as an investment banker, I can personally recommend the Selling Your Business Guide that you mentioned. So that's a nice testimonial for you there. Last question is, what are the best avenues for buyers to find sellers, Peter? Well, <clears throat> I think um, I think it, it varies uh, a little bit. I can tell you that the, you know, the sort of old school original playbook was, it was all in person, really all beating the bushes, whether it's just general business networking, um, you know, just uh, hanging around the country club, um, attending some really well-run industry trade shows and conferences. Um, th those have been ways that buyers can identify sellers. It takes time and it takes hard work. Um, I think that um, that's a, a, a playbook that still works. Um, I think in the last five to 10 years, a lot of information has come online. Um, we've built a tool on Axial that a lot of buyers use to identify sellers. There are other tools that buyers can use to really get leverage and spend their time more wisely so that they're not just sort of hunting and pecking one by one by one. Um, I think if you're really serious about it, um, it requires a lot of time, a lot of focus. We know investment bankers that actually help buyers find sellers um, and they do it for a profession. Most investment bankers spend the majority of their time helping sellers uh, sell their business, but some investment bankers have actually established what's called a buy-side advisory practice, and you can hire them for uh, a monthly retainer and a success fee uh, to pursue and identify targets on your behalf. Um, so there's online solutions like Axial, there's old school business networking, and there's professional investment bankers who uh, who um, uh, actually specialize in doing buy side uh, identification of seller targets. Um, I think that's a, a relatively good list. Uh, there's other ideas too, but I think those are maybe the key three. Peter, you did an excellent job today. I'm glad your voice held out for us. Uh, you sounded <laughs> <Me> terrific. <too. laughs> thank, thank you so much. <laughs> For, for all of your great information and for answering the, the number of questions. We have a few questions we're not going to be able to get to today, uh, but you can email those to Peter at peter at axial.net as it shows on your screen now. I want to remind you that you will be getting a, a link to this presentation, a recorded link in about a week. You'll get an email and a link and a thank you. And I wanted to remind you about a couple upcoming Vistage uh, webinars Friday, December 16th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Earning It, The Obstacles Facing Women in the Workplace with Joanne Lublin and Diane Darling. And on Friday, January 6th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, The Economic and Financial Market Outlook with Jeffrey Mortimer, CFA, Direct Director of Investment Strategies at BNY Mellon Wealth Management. Thank you so much for joining us for Fridays with Vista today, Peter. Thank you once again for a tremendous uh, uh, and inspiring overview for business owners everywhere. You bet, Bill. Thank you, and, and thanks to everybody at Vistage. It was a great opportunity for me, so hope to talk to you all again soon. Wishing you all the best of success. This concludes the webinar for today.